you know that scene in Brooklyn Nine Nine where Captain Hold is like. Are you familiar with the story of Moneyball? A man uses statistics and logic to win several baseball games. It's my favorite film. That's me. I'm Captain Holt. Because Moneyball slaps and you are all missing out on it. Now sure, this movie's about baseball but shows none of the fun things about baseball. And sure, it's just a movie about a bunch of absurdly rich people and the one guy who isn't as rich as them and that's what makes his life hard. But I mean this when I say that Moneyball is my favorite film of all time. Now, I don't follow baseball, but this isn't really about baseball. It has so much more going on. A critique of modern business. A character story about a quiet obsessive angry man trying to keep being a positive role model for his daughter while everything seems to be sabotaging him. And whether you're into sports movies or not, it is absolutely worth a watch. This movie follows the Oakland Athletics. Now, I don't follow baseball, but do you know why some sports teams do better than others? There's a very simple and infuriating reason. Because American League Baseball is completely rigged. You see, the rich baseball teams have more money to spend on all the best players. Oakland, California's team has almost three times less money than the Yankees. Yankees. So even if you manage to get some really good players, the rich teams will just buy them off of you and basically beat you with your own team in the next season. This game is rigged! That's kind of how Major League Baseball works. And if that idea frustrates you, then you'll understand why Brad Pitt keeps throwing furniture in this movie. See, we all know what it's like to be an underdog, to feel like the system is rigged against us. What are we doing here, Mark? And maybe you've thought to yourself, man, I wish I could just change the system so that everything was more fair. Well, Moneyball is about a guy who actually tried to do that. Billy Bean is the manager of one of the poorest baseball teams and wants to figure out a new way to spend the money that they do have to win the championship. He meets up with Peter Brand and he catches wind of the idea that some baseball players are being way undervalued for what they're worth. So if they can take advantage of this, they can build a championship team on their budget. So basically they use a combination of math and people skills to try and cheese their way into a victory. But a lot of the people that he works with still rely on that old system of judging players. And one by one, he's got to cut down the members that aren't on board. So why does this movie work? For one thing, it's accessible. So if you don't know anything about baseball, like me, I don't follow baseball, or if you just don't care at all, it's actually easier to understand where the characters are coming from. They want to restructure their team into one that's based on the players who actually get the most points. And they do that by picking from the reject pile, the players that don't fit into the established idea of what a good baseball player is. People are overlooked for a variety of biased reasons and, and perceived flaws. Age, appearance, personality. Bill James and mathematics cut straight through that. That frame of logic is super easy to understand and it makes you empathize with them. Of course they should try to get the most points, that makes sense. But then everyone else is like, no, we can't change the way that things are done, what's wrong with you? And boom, we connect with the main character, we're on his side. So if you're not into baseball, you'll still understand what this movie is really about. Systematic change and why it's super hard. It's a super interesting, really simple story that's told exceptionally well. And that's all because of the writing, the director, and the cast. So Aaron Sorkin worked on this screenplay and I think that speaks for itself, so I'm just gonna move on. Bennett Miller is a genius. This guy is my favorite director. He's made three films! And they're all incredible! Why isn't this guy a big name? One of the most important jobs a director has is to manage your film's tone, and each one of Bennett Miller's films has a very striking and specific tone. A tone that's hard to describe without just showing you the movie. It's like a comfy, meditative drive. I just watch them and I'm like, mwah, yum! He has a very low-key style. He's not the kind of eye-catching, eye-popping director you'd normally watch out for. But his work is extremely refined. This guy knows what he is doing. His shots have a lot of stillness, but they're all very beautiful. It's always a very decent saturated, naturalistic look. And he edits them together very aggressively to complement that stillness. He puts a lot of focus onto the performances that he's getting from his actors. And even though his shots aren't super eye-catching, he has a very noticeable style to me. One of my favorite quirks about him is that he'll play a shot and then cut to another shot that's just the same angle, but closer. Like, the exact same angle. This way he gets the most he can out of a specific point of view. We're violently thrust into the character's head, but we still have a very fresh idea of what their environment is around them. This way you get all the benefits of a wide-angle shot and all the benefits of a close-up shot without changing where the camera is. This way, the specific camera angle that he's chosen is milked for all it's worth. I think this is genius and probably saves a lot of time on set, too. Every time I watch one of his movies, I think, 
Oh, are we gonna, are we gonna, Hey! If you're gonna do a zoom, you might think of doing it naturally in camera, but by having the zoom happen within the space of a single frame, it's actually a lot more jarring than if you zoomed in really quickly. Like, whoa, oh, geez, okay, we're, we're here, damn. And now you're in the character's head. In the first scene of Moneyball, this zoom cut happens twice in a row. It's very deliberate. It's a very subtle stylistic decision that I sometimes appreciate more than the eye-catching ones. But another exceptional thing about Moneyball in particular is its use of archive footage. Bennett Miller comes from a documentary background. And because this is based on a true story and was a highly documented event, he takes full advantage of that skill set. Most of the actual baseball scenes happen via the TV, where most of our characters are actually watching it from. The Oakland Athletics 20 game streak was a big moment for baseball. Apparently, I don't follow baseball. And you cannot talk about Moneyball without talking about this sequence. The streak is a section of the movie that's almost like a short film plopped right in the middle. It's an artistic depiction of the momentum that the Oakland A's had while accomplishing this historic streak. Bennett bottles this massive feeling of momentum by fusing his own footage with actual archive footage of the games. It's a bizarre fourth wall melting experience. Combining these two styles makes the emotion run deeper than either could on their own. All with this detached eye of a documentarian that makes it feel intimate and real. It's deeply moving. <laughs> easily the highlight of the movie. It plays to all the film's strengths. While all the fans were completely confused as to how this ragtag group of outcast players managed to do so well in the league, we as an audience get a peek behind the curtain throughout the whole film, and it makes for a deliciously satisfying viewing experience. Moneyball's frenetic editing makes statistical analysis moving. Billy, this is Chad Bradford. He's a relief pitcher. He is one of the most undervalued players in baseball. This guy could be not just the best pitcher in our bullpen, one of the most effective relief pitchers in all of baseball. This guy should cost $3 million a year. We can get him for $237,000. I don't know about you, man, but I got fucking chills and I want to look at some math. Because it's not about the numbers, it's about what the numbers mean. Moneyball uses film language to translate this to the audience, and it's really fucking effective. Do you see why Captain Holt loves this movie? The statistical analysis. <laughs> it's so beautiful. Uh, so Jonah Hill's in this movie. Dear God. It's me, Jonah Hill, for Moneyball. And it's my favorite performance of his ever. When you think of a Jonah Hill character, you think of a guy standing in a parking lot, yelling at his friends about how wrong they are about something. So this was a massive departure for him. He gives an incredibly restrained and calculated performance with a thick shell of shyness and insecurity while hiding a burning verve and love for life and a passion for baseball right underneath the surface, only peeking through at critical moments. He's a decent lead off hitter. He can steal bases, but is he worth the seven and a half million dollars a year that the Boston Red Sox are paying him? No. And it pairs so well with the Brad Pitt angry macho charisma thing. They're both so different, but they come together in their need to win, and they form such a beautiful friendship. Also, Chris Pratt is in this. This is the era of Chris Pratt, right between Parks and Rec and Guardians of the Galaxy. He plays a macho guy, but he's also kind of meek. His character feels like he's in way over his head. He's playing every scene on the back foot, unlike all of his other roles. I can't throw the ball at yeah. all. You throw in your last ball from behind home plate what I'd say. Fun fact about this scene, Bennett Miller called Chris Pratt a pussy in between takes, and so you can see him mouth the words, why are you calling me a pussy? You gonna call me a fucking pussy? Pratt's character has been selected by the computer, basically, to be the first baseman, even though he's never done it before. So by insulting Chris Pratt right before the cameras rolled, the performance feels a lot more uncomfortable, like he's really embarrassing himself. All this to say this performance is really unique for Chris Pratt, so if you're a fan of his, you need to watch this movie. So Brad Pitt, Jonah Hill, and Chris Pratt all kill it. Guess who also kills it? Everybody! Look, it's Philip Seymour Hoffman. Oh, look over here, there's Robin Wright. Spike Jones, what the fuck are you doing here? Because Bennett Miller's such a good actor's director, everybody is on their A-game. But even the other actors are super memorable. This head scout character who's really against the whole idea, he's played by a former professional baseball player who in real life, and to this day, including through the filming of this movie, thinks that Billy Bean ruined baseball. If you're looking for a genuine performance of a guy hating your main character, this is genius casting. But on top of that, every player in Moneyball except for Chris Pratt, was a professional baseball player at some point. I would take this baseball team against any other baseball team from any other baseball movie ever, and we would kick their asses. <laughs> Here's another reason. Moneyball knows how to use a metaphor. There's this cool montage where Brad Pitt is encouraging everyone on the team to play to the team's strengths, and he's giving out all these tips, and then he says, This is a process. It's a process. It's a process. Okay? And then it cuts to him running. And it's like, 
Yeah, working to change a system is a slow and mind-numbing process, just like working out. Every time Billy and Peter make a decision, and then that decision is carried out on the field, Billy goes and works out. Now, I hate working out. It sucks. But I do it because I know that my body will be healthier in the long run. And Brad Pitt's character knows that having these difficult phone calls and conversations will lead to having a more successful team. It's a metaphor. I know it's a metaphor. And the score of the movie also supports this. It uses very repetitive themes and it uses the same two cello notes over and over again. The repeated notes represent the monotony of having to do the same thing again and again, but the chords underneath the repetitive pattern build and build until it's this beautiful big sound. The music is doing the exact same thing that the characters are doing and it's genius. It's just so fucking good. And that's not even to mention the inspired use of the song by This Will Destroy You called The Mighty Rio Grande. It's a sick band that plays post-rock instrumental music that builds like a bitch and is wildly life-affirming. It's music that feels like it's chugging down tracks slowly and patiently, but determined to reach its destination. It cannot be stopped and things will change. All these elements work together to make something that's genuinely inspiring. This isn't that fake motivational corporate bullshit that tells you to work harder and all your problems will be solved. It's a more grounded, realistic motivation. It tells you not to work harder, but smarter. It's not trying to make some massive statement about humanity, but a smaller, more poignant one. A smaller truth about what it actually takes to change the world. And because it's smaller, it resonates more. Beyond the initial romanticism of getting a group of misfits to all do as well as they did. Like, an island of misfit toys. I don't know man, this scene is just really inspiring to me. It's like a metaphor for life. Who should be on your team? Who are the people you should really surround yourself with to succeed? Is it the kind of people that everyone thinks are really cool? Or is a person's real value found when you dig a little deeper? You want a team of people in your life who have real value. And it doesn't matter what they look like, who they are. If they come in clutch when it counts, that's when you know you've got a real teammate. It's a metaphor. I know it's a metaphor. Whether you're building a business or just a social circle, this is something important that we should all learn. Which leads me to the only actual baseball scene in Moneyball. After watching every baseball game through screens, Billy actually goes to see how all of these trading decisions manifest on the field. The camera angles all change to support this shift in perspective, and it's a really cool moment. And then they start losing, and so he just goes back inside. And as the other team slowly catches up to them, he goes back and sits down in the gym. But this time, he's not working out. He's already put all the work in. There's nothing more he can do, so now he just has to wait and see if it pays off. So the teams are tied, and they're so close to getting their 20-game streak. And then the coach, who's just been a dick the whole movie, finally decides to just trust the new kid, the one that Billy's been vouching for this entire time and he scores the winning point. The crack of the bat echoes all the way across the park and even to the gym where Billy Bean is and he lifts his head. Did I just hear that? And then boom. It's the only real sports movie moment in the whole film. But it doesn't just rely on your love of the sport in order to make it a romantic moment. They put the groundwork in by having it be about the characters. And because the characters have worked so long and hard to make it happen, when it finally happens, you feel something. Moneyball is a reminder that the tedious and the mundane are the real keys to solving the problems around you, to making a difference. How can you not be romantic about baseball? Real hard work is not sexy. It's not romantic. But whatever it is you're doing right now, if you keep working smart, one of these days you might find yourself in a really transcendent moment. A moment you'll remember for the rest of your life. The team doesn't win the championship in the end. Spoilers for a real thing that happened 20 years ago. And just like in real life, you won't get exactly what it is you want, but it'll still be worth it. The ending conversation with the Red Sox owner really kind of sets this out. I know you're taking it in the teeth out there, but the first guy through the wall, he always gets bloody. And every time that happens, whether it's a government or a way of doing business or whatever it is, people who are holding the reins, they have their hands on the switch, they go batshit crazy. The systems that we have on our planet are not perfect, but changing those systems into something better is really hard to do. And if you're gonna change the world, you're gonna get beat up along the way. So if you're working at something important, you don't need credit. You don't need adoration or attention for it. You just need to surround yourself with the people who challenge you and support you. And working towards some goal, no matter how impossible or idealistic it is, can really help give your life meaning. Moneyball has always been there for me as a simple reminder of these truths. It's not a cool movie to love, but it's the movie that has given me the most value in my life. It's a metaphor. I know it's a metaphor. And it has stuck with me ever since it came out. Sure, this movie has a cult following, but I think it's been forgotten by everyone else. And I think that's a real shame. What I'm trying to say is, if you're a fan of filmmaking, you need to watch Moneyball. And be sure to remember, if nothing else from this video, I don't follow baseball.
The real money ball was the friends we made along the way. Hi, I'm Ben, one of the editors for this channel. You can follow me on Twitter for more hot takes or Instagram for some pretty photos of my ugly mug. Also, listen to my EP. It's got good vibes. Also, if you can do me a favor and leave a like on this video, it'll help James know that you don't hate me. If you do hate me though, leave a dislike, why not? Also, there are videos here every Sunday, Tuesday, and Thursday. Stay safe, my dudes. I love you. <laughs>